Presented by Caltech. This is the figure that started Gordon Moore's plot, which became Moore's Law. It started with a single transistor here in 1959. And by 1965, when there were several hundred transistors on a single chip, Gordon made his famous plot of the number of transistors on a single piece of silicon as a function of the year and predicted that the number of transistors would grow exponentially with time. I was working with Gordon at the time, and he showed me that picture, and he showed me this plot, and he asked me, what could the physics of the devices say about this absolutely remarkable prediction that people would get excited about this and keep designing things that had more and more transistors on them? It would do more and more useful things faster and faster. Well, about 1968, right in here, I was asked to give a talk at a IEEE workshop where a lot of the device physics people were going to be attending. And I had been pondering Gordon's question for a couple of years by then. And the more I thought about it, the more I thought, look, I have to simplify the question. It's too complicated. Why don't I ask a simpler question? one that I might have some chance of answering. Why don't I say, let's look at MOS transistors that we make exactly the same as we make today. And let's just reduce the dimensions. Do nothing else. Don't make them out of different materials. Don't make them shape differently. Don't do any of that. Just shrink all the dimensions. What would happen? So this is a slide I showed at that 1968 workshop. And it's a very simple slide. It says the charge in transit is whatever charge you put on the gate to turn the transistor on. And the current is that charge divided by the transit time. So the time, the transit time, is just the length, how far it has to go, divided by the velocity. Now, how are we going to do this? Well, we're going to shrink all the dimensions but if you, if you do that, then the electric field, which is the voltage you put on the gate divided by the thickness, then it gets higher than the material can stand. So supposing we scale the voltages too. So we scale the voltages down exactly with the dimensions. Now that keeps all the electric fields more or less the same. And so it's physics we understand, and we're not changing too many things at once. And if you do that, the power per device goes like the square. So if you scale it down by a factor of a 10, the power will go down by a factor of 100. Well, that means that if we make a chip and put 100 times more transistors on it, it'll dissipate the same power. Well, we're getting rid of the power now, so we'll be able to do it then. The amazing thing that happened is the performance, the speed of computing I get per unit power goes like the cube. So if I scale the transistors down by a factor of 10, I get a thousand times more computing per unit power. I say, it can't be true. Murphy's Law won't let you do anything that's that good. But that's what this argument gives. So I gave the talk. There were all kinds of arguments and people screaming at me. And Bob Denard uh, from IBM, the guy that invented the dynamic random access memory, was there. And you could see he was not convinced, but he was thinking about it. Well, there was another such conference the next year, and Bob gave his talk. And he had done the thing over again his own way, and he came to very much the same conclusion that I had. Well, now there are two of us, one of us from an academic place and one from an industrial place, and uh, people begin to pay attention. I had a fantastic graduate student at the time by the name of Bruce Honeisen, 
who's gone on to do remarkable things. And we started working together on putting a little more detail to this. What would the transistors really look like? Could we really believe that if we took all the bad things that people said could happen into account, would still work? And we came to some really remarkable conclusions. This was in 1971, and we said that you could get 10 to the eighth transistors per square centimeter, and the chips would still work. There was a lot of debate about that, because that was a long way from where we were. This wasn't the only transistor we calculated, but it was one that we felt very confident you could just build and it would work. And it had a quarter micron channel length. Well, at the time we did this, the Intel process had nine micron channel lengths. So that was a factor of 36, the factor of like 50,000 in power per operation of logic. It was a huge step beyond what anybody had thought. We got lots of pushback, of course. We were particularly concerned about the electron tunneling through the gate oxide. So we designed those two little transistors very carefully. And remember, that was up here in 1971. And this slide shows what the industry actually did. And after 30 years or so, we're down here. And uh, the circles are real production processes that uh, the industry put into production. And the little triangles are experimental processes that were reported in the literature. And these two squares, that one and that one, are the two very small transistors that we designed in our 1971 paper. And you can see, by the time the industry got there, 30 years later, they did pretty much what we said. My friend Dave Ferry sent me a slide that he'd used at one of his talks. And he had uh, plotted what people's prediction was of where the transistors would start running out of gas as a function of the year. And of course, people were getting better at it. And uh, this is us here. It turned out he made a bit of a mistake. Actually, we're right there. And we did another transistor right there. But the point is, we were like 15 years ahead of what other people were thinking. And when you're ahead like that, uh, you attract all the flack, and we got plenty of, of flack. But the flack helps in a way because it means they're paying attention. So the more argument you get, the more likely it is for someone to hear about it that's going to think about it carefully. Well, people started thinking about it carefully in those days, and this is what happened. We were back here in uh, 1971, with a few hundred devices per square millimeter now. And we had said that it would be possible to make things with 10 to the eighth per square centimeter at 10 to the sixth per square millimeter. So we would be able to make things up here. So we were more than 30 years ahead in this prediction. Now it's very rare that anybody makes a prediction that holds up over 30 years. But this one was based on physics we knew. We didn't say that you couldn't make transistors smaller than this. We just said when you got there, you would start to have problems that weren't solvable just by scaling and doing everything else the same. And it turned out that indeed around 2005, people started having to use other materials, having to use other geometries, having to build things in a little more sophisticated way to avoid the very limitations that we talked about. So that was a good time. And what it's led to is Moore's Law, which was a combination of the compelling case that Gordon had made that if you're able to make more and more transistors on a chip. It will bring down the cost of computing in a remarkable way, and it certainly has. But in order to do that, people had to believe that the devices would work. And that's where 
it was important that we had worked on the scaling to give people a tangible prediction that actually worked out when they went and started working on it. And we've got our modern information technology to show for it.